Calling the market top, but only if you dare. Live from Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romain Bostic. And I'm Alex Steele. The market does not want to stay and go down. The market does what it wants, Alex. Have it you does. I, it's like yeah. my daughter. No matter what I say, you're still going to listen to Taylor Swift. All right, we're kicking off to the closing bell right here in the U.S. So to the point, yes, we're down two tenths of one percent for the S&P, but volume is light. And I got to say, it's just really hard to get a meaningful, longer lasting decline when the overall equity market. Uh, Bitcoin also having a really nice surge, the highest price level that we've seen uh, in about a couple years. And the question really becomes, if you have animal spirits coming in, buying Bitcoin, uh, buying certain areas of the market, can the overall index really go down? Uh, to your yield, tiny bit of a bid. I've been hearing short covering in the market from leverage funds as well as CTA. So uh, yields down by about four basis points. And the Bloomberg dollar index remain the highest level that we've seen since June of 2022. That sustained dollar strength really continuing within the market. Yeah, absolutely. And you talk about the low volume, at least on the equity side, the price action, really tepid. Tepid once again here for the S&P on this third trading session of the week, showing what will likely be the third tightest trading range of the year. Now, is this simply a stop, a breathe, a reset of the rally after last Friday's record high, or is it time to finally call a market top? That's the question really being posed by Goldman Sachs tactical specialist Scott Rubner, who says the rally, well, it felt tired last week, and the market today starting to look like, quote, a fuller house. But he says he's not brave enough to call the top yet, as he sees no meaningful negative catalyst out there that would spark a meltdown. Look at retail traders. They sat out most of 2023's big rally here, and, well, They've been lured back into the pool big time, and nowhere is the YOLO FOMO one-two punch evident than in the crypto space. Alex was just talking about it. Bitcoin above 60,000. It kissed 64,000 at one point in the day, barely $5,000 away from that $69,000 intraday high back in 2021. The successful launch of the U.S. spot Bitcoin ETFs and an upcoming reduction in supply growth fueling a rally, a rally drawing a lot of rubbernecking by investors who had moved to the crypto sidelines. This is not the state institutional trade either that marked the market for the last year or so. This is that retail army lacing up its boots and running back on to that field. And it's not just Bitcoin either. This is a broader shift overall in financial market sentiment, particularly among that retail set. The latest Charles Schwab Trader Sentiment Survey last week, it showed that more than half of the retail traders on the platform were bullish on U.S. stocks for this quarter. And Bloomberg Intelligence found that about 80 percent of the retail broker order flow last quarter, Alex, were from stocks not listed in the S&P 500. And that indicates that maybe this horde coming off the sidelines really is thinking a lot broader about this market. Right. So the bad breath conversation, maybe that's not such, uh, such a thing anymore. But the question really is, if the Fed winds up cutting, are we going to get a bubble for sure? Mm -hmm. And then what do you do with the positioning there? But OK, here's my hypothesis. It's still just about tech. And this is why I say that. So this is uh, the orange line is uh, the small cap uh, growth index. OK, then the white line is a small cap value index. And they relatively move uh, in line with the exception of what we've seen so far this year. You've seen a real outperformance with the uh, small cap growth stocks versus small cap value, which makes me think, OK, sure, maybe we're seeing a rally that's broadening. But in reality, is it still just about the growthier tech names and not about the deep cyclicals and value stocks? It's just kind of a a good breath fake out, Romain. Yeah, I mean, this is going to be the real question here, the conundrum, not just whether the market goes up, but the complexion of any additional rally. Andrew Slimman joining us right now to help kick us off to the close. Senior Portfolio Manager and Head of Applied Equity Advisors at Morgan Stanley Investment uh, Management. Andrew, watch the money, watch retail investors. Is that what we should be doing right now? Well, I think it's it's a classic second year off a bear market low. First year, unfortunately, because people frame their views looking in the rearview mirror, we saw uh, pretty much every week outflows from equities and ETFs and stocks or mutual funds and ETFs. And it always takes about a year of selling off the lows where the market rallies where then retail flips and they flip and they start to buy. And that's what we saw in November. Flows turned positive. And now we're start, starting to scale a little bit more of a speculative element, as you have articulated. All this is very consistent with trading patterns mm -hmm. of previous bull markets off bear market lows. So yeah. I don't think it's that unusual. 
I still think it's early. You know, bull markets are born on pessimism. That was last year. They grow on skepticism. Yeah. This is this year. We're a long way from optimism or euphoria. So the sentiment story is certainly there that could maybe at least at a minimum put a floor under where we are right now, if not lead to an additional rally. But are the fundamentals, corporate fundamentals, as well as economic fundamentals, going to support additional gains? Sure. So I always am very careful about sentiment because sentiment indicators always tell you what's happened recently in the past. I always watch what people are doing with their money, and that's only turned positive. But the fundamentals, look, uh, if you look at pre-fourth quarter earnings season and post, the reality is the bottom-up consensus earnings for the S&P for this year and next are higher today than where they were before fourth quarter earnings. So it was a very good earnings season. So fundamentals have supported, you know, this rally. And, and in terms of, you know, Alex's initial point, which is the market just won't go down, I think one of the reasons for that, very important to understand, keep in mind, the market hit a peak of 47.96 in January of 2022. It took two years to break above that. We only broke above it last month. I just don't think 6% above that previous peak is where the money market runs out of steam. So, yes, the market is overbought on a short-term basis, but okay. I don't think you're going to get much of a pullback. Okay, Andrew, however, dot, 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 but. So if this is the year of skepticism, if the Fed does cut, does that sort of move us into bubble territory? I think so. Okay, think so the, but that's a material it, it, risk, no? Yes, yeah. I think the, the issue is, is that as the Fed cuts later in the year, you're going to see things like your small cap index, you know, maybe value will pick up because that those uh, small caps are more dependent on financing and lower rates is better than for large caps. So I think you'll see even further broadening more speculation if the Fed, uh, you know, were to cut. And they certainly, you know, are validated because inflation has, has come down. But I will caveat all that I'm saying is that in the second year, you tend to get more volatile in markets. So last year, the market pretty much went straight up. It, you know, there wasn't many bumps along the way. Um, and so I think at some point we will get a, you know, uh, a healthier correction. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's now, but I do think it will be this, you know, potentially this summer. And, you know, when the Fed first cuts, you're going to hear more people say, oh, it's not just because they've beaten inflation. There's a problem out there. Uh -huh. And I think that's creates some more anxiety in the stock market. But to that point, are there problems out there? I mean, maybe in different areas. Like, is there a reason that small cap value isn't outperforming? Like, mid, mid cap banks, small banks are in trouble. Like, th there are issues within the market. Yeah. It's just really bifurcated. Correct. I think that's absolutely right, that, that the small caps encapsulates more uh, banks that have more commercial real estate exposure, for instance. So that's weighing on stocks. And also there's, uh, you know, the earnings season for the big guys have been very, very strong and they're buying back stock. That's the key thing here. There's a huge bid by companies to buy back the stocks at the large cap era. So I can understand why we're seeing this bifurcation, but I still think lower rates will help small caps. Andrew, always great to talk to you. Andrew Slumman, Senior Portfolio Manager at Morgan Stanley Investment Management, helping us kick off to the close here on this Wednesday afternoon when we come back after the break. Some great conversations on tap, including a discussion about credit, a discussion about real estate and banks with Marathon Asset Management CEO Bruce Richards. All right, plus highlights from our interview with Akava CEO Brett Shulman, his insight on the latest earnings release, expansion plans, and the impact of those buzzy weight loss drugs. And we go from a behemoth in the, uh, I guess, fast casual space to, well, an upstart in that space as well. The minds behind Slutty Vegan and Big Dave's Cheese Steaks. Pinky Cole, Derek Hayes joining the big program in just a second. Their insights on running a business and helping other entrepreneurs. That's coming up next right here on The Close on Bloomberg.
of Kava are up today after reporting strong results. The fast casual chain thrived as more people visited and shelled out for premium dishes. And appetite for Kava has not waned since its IPO in June. Romain and I spoke with CEO and co-founder Brett Shulman about the latest results, expansion plans, and the company's pricing power. Our last price increase was in January of 2023, and we took roughly 25 to 3% in uh, January of this year, the only planned price increase for 2024. And in fact, we talked about absorbing a 30 basis point impact from uh, legislation in California known as AB 1228, whose predecessor was known as the FAST Act, and this takes minimum wage up to $20 an hour or more. And we look at this as, again, an investment in our team. We don't want to pass along that unplanned cost to our guests and uh, really uh, absorb that on our guest behalf. So no incremental price increase plan uh, to address uh, AB 1228. Which is then making, Brett, uh, your margins all the more impressive. So as you have to pay more, say, minimum wage across the board, what's your other inflation or cost profile like right now? Yeah, it's been moderating year over year. And I think also on the COG side, we've seen pretty benign inflationary pressures in our a direct source model on the supply chain. We uh, directly source over 87% of our ingredients as well as our vertically integrated manufacturing infrastructure. So really exciting. Uh, last month, uh, we came online with our new state-of-the-art 55,000 square foot facility in Southwest Virginia. This is in addition to our existing facility in Laurel, Maryland. Mm -hmm. And this is a centralized facility where we produce our chef crafted recipes, our dips and spreads. Think uh, crazy feta, tzatziki and harissa. We're, really, we're able to do it at really high quality uh, and uh, consistency at scale and take that complexity out of the four walls of our restaurant and deliver that great value to our guests. I'll take some crazy feta. Sure, why not? Hey, Brett, um, speaking of, um, are you noticing a weight loss drug effect, like an Azemphic effect, either negative or positive for your business? Yeah, we talked about this last year that the early data we were seeing and anecdotally was that this would be a net positive for us, that people were really cutting out alcohol and fattier foods and snacking and gravitating to uh, more food and diet like kava. And there was actually a William Blair report out recently that showed that we were one of the, the greatest beneficiaries of uh, the um, advent of the uh, GLP-1 drugs. So it, it, this gets us to a, a broader question here, Brett, and that gets to this idea of how do you expand this business? There's been a lot of discussion already uh, about the current footprint, the idea of moving into new geographical er areas that you're not don't necessarily have a big presence in and includes places like Chicago and, and other major cities, but also the real estate cost that's associated with that. How hard is it right now to find locations that are cost effective to that plan? Yeah, we have not had issues. We're very excited about the opportunity in front of us and our pipeline that we've built. Remember, we operate in 24 states and the District of Columbia. We do not have any presence in the upper Midwest, and we've talked about opening the Chicago market, our first foray into the upper Midwest, and just the ability for us to succeed in so many different ways. You think about we operate in the urban area, in cities, in suburbs, in small towns, in the East Coast, in the center of the country, and the West Coast. So that allows us to cast a really broad net to source these new sites to, uh, to support our growth. Brett Shulman there, that was the co-founder and CEO over at Kava. We had a chance to catch up with him earlier today. And it's interesting, we, we kind of wonder, what's sort of helping them? Is that a Kava-specific story, mm -hmm. or is there something broader going on in the, in the food space? Yeah, and was it the IPO? Like, did that help brand awareness, or is it eating healthier, or is it yeah. uh, a pandemic-related thing, mm -hmm. and how that expansion is going to play out? Yeah, and of course, that IPO always provides a bit of a halo for any company, a lot of attention. And it's funny, talking about Kava, you know, you're talking about a company that, what, has a $6 billion market cap, mm -hmm. a company that, um, what, you know, started, what, barely 13 years ago, one location here, and now it's a behemoth. And that really brings us to our next guest, because maybe they're building the next Kava, maybe the next McDonald's, who knows? But they are sort of a, one of the most uh, talked about uh, food companies out there. Slutty Vegan is a fast food chain offering up burgers and vibes in Georgia, Alabama, New York, and maybe more places as well. Another company, Dave's Cheese Steak, a little bit of a different end of the spectrum there, uh, also with big expansion plans here uh, based in Atlanta. I'm pleased to say that the founders of those companies are joining us right Right now, Pinky Cole Hayes, the founder of Slutty Vegan, and her husband, Derek Hayes, the founder and CEO of Big Dave's Cheese Steak. And just to be clear, you're not Dave. No, Who no, is no. Dave? Dave is my father. So my father had, uh, he got diagnosed with lung cancer in 2009. Mm -hmm. He wound up passing away, and I honored my business to him. So I, 
everything, every, everything Big Dave always, people say is, why are you so small? And it's my father. So I, I take that with dignity every day. All right. I appreciate that. That's yep. a sweet story. And I mean, everybody's looking at the success you've had. Of course, the success that you've had, Pinky, in building out Slutty Vegan from your, basically your apartment to a food truck to now, what, about 11 or 12 locations around the country? I will have 17 locations by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Thank you. It's hard work. <laughs> <laughs> I was, was going to say. There's a lot of things that are probably hard about that, but I'm wondering what the hardest part is for, for both of you. Like running your own business, you're exposed to a lot of costs like labor, a lot of food input costs, and then the demand side of the story. What's the hardest part? Um, I could go down the list. So the first thing worst is... Worst hardest. <laughs> um, the worst hardest is making sure that you have the right talent, right? So this just started as a dream. I know for me, I didn't build Slutty Vegan to make money, right? Money just came as a result of the dream. Mm -hmm. So as you grow a company and scale, this is my first time being a CEO of a multi-million dollar company. Mm -hmm. It is important for me to make sure that I have the right teammates on my team to be able to grow and scale the business in the way that I know that it can grow. I believe in my heart that this is a billion dollar brand but I have to have the people who have the right mindset and the same ethos to be able to do that and that has not always been the easiest. So know what you're good at, know what you're not good at, yes. and then, which is really hard to do if you're yes. in charge. Derek, what about you? Um, inflation. Um, you know, you look at inflation from 2020 to now, we almost up 20%, so the prices changed. I used to be able to build a location around 500000 now it cost me another 750 upwards to 800000 So I think that's a big problem, us getting coolers, um, grills, all those things. But also, <clears throat> just like Pinky said, this is my first time doing it, you know. So all the mistakes I'm making, I'm learning as I go. So team is important, and I finally got the team that I needed, and that's why I'm, I'm franchising right now. On the inflation side, though, ha has that increase in costs slowed a bit? Um, no. No. Um, no. <laughs> it's, it's rising. I mean, but, you yeah. know, you just have to adjust to it. You know, in your price point, you find out where yeah. your bottom line is at and try to work around it. But yeah. the hard part is moving to different areas. Like, you know, for Pinky, she, she went to New York. You know, you look at L.A. And, and New York ain't cheap. It's totally different. <laughs> Those are two really expensive markets. Yeah. yeah. Very expensive. Yeah. Not only is it expensive for the, the vegan market, mm -hmm. we've seen a decline, yeah. right? And, and total transparency is the truth, right? So in that decline, because we are a brand that people love, yeah. we've been able to sustain. But obviously, we are faced with the same challenges that most of the vegan restaurants are facing as well. Right. Luckily, we have a very popular brand that people love. It's noted and doted. Mm -hmm. um, and it allows us to continue to grow and scale every step of the way. I am curious, though, about how you price your product. I mean, it's a good product. It is at the higher end of the spectrum, at least for you know a burger, even if you compare it to a meat-based burger here. How do you sort of arrive, not just what's cost-effective for you, but also what's going to make sure it's not going to turn away potential consumers? Well, the reality of it is, is the consumer experience comes first, right? Mm -hmm. Like, we want the consumer to have a quality product that tastes good, but you're not just paying for the food when you come to Slutty Vegan. There's a community element that is connected to the business, mm -hmm. right? Like, we have the Pinky Co. Foundation. We pay the rents of local businesses. We pay for LLCs. We make sure that people have what they need as far as bridging the wealth gap, right? So when you and, pay and for a burger... Start, uh, it was an American Sesh. American what, can what, explain this. This is basically. <laughs> Good what, is it, what is it like? Shark Tank or what? What is it? Better I, than that. Better than um, that. <laughs> basically, yeah. Church. yeah. So basically, what we do is we bridge the gap between entrepreneurs, celebrities, and creatives, and we give them a safe space to be able to have the resources that they need to be the best versions of themselves. Mm -hmm. So when you pay for a slutty vegan burger, you are paying also for that community element to be able to pour back into the communities that we serve, and that's been the mission since day one. So do you have an X amount of your uh, profits? that go towards community-based, or is it not so, that scientific? So so it's not that scientific okay. because we have the Pinky Co. Foundation, and obviously those things are separate, but it's important for us to be able to give back. You can see it on the news all the time, right? Like, we are known as a business to be community-driven, and that's what we've historically done, and it's given us an opportunity to continue to grow because we continue to lift people up as we climb. Is there a competition between you two? Yes. Burger and plants? Yes. <laughs> you like compare the profits, compare nah, the No, but the good, the, good, the good thing is at the end of the night, we get to look, look at each other's sales, and that's how we control the market. We're able to see, well, if she's down or I'm up, or I'm down, she's he up. Lying. He like, how much money did you make today? <laughs> <laughs> what nah, did you do in your downtown location? It's a, it's, a, it's a good feeling because, you know, I mean, piggybacking off of your wife, you can see what's going on. Like, y'all in the same household, y'all doing the same things, and we're able to accomplish things that we want and we dream together. So, like, you know, it's a beautiful thing. I think the most beautiful thing here is that this is a husband and wife duo, both CEOs. We both come from inner city communities, and we are changing the dynamic of what entrepreneurship really looks like. Mm -hmm. We're going to come back here in five years, and y'all going to say, damn, y'all are a billion-dollar oh, brand yeah. separately, For sure. right? And, and, when, we, and when you come back, are you going to have other folks with you who you help to sort of build oh, yeah. whether they're from East Baltimore, Atlanta, or Absolutely. whatever? Absolutely. Yeah.
You, right. you got to bring you people up as you climb. I mean, that's important. I think for both brands, like, when we pit our businesses in these communities, we're hiring yeah. within. So we're not hiring without. So we're bringing up those communities. So each location, you got about 30 people that's having new jobs. Some of them people didn't know what they want to do with their life. Mm -hmm. They get inside of these companies and yeah. realize that this is not a job. This is a career. This is room to grow. I mean, when you look at companies, you just look at where can, when can you grow at in that company for your yeah. career. And, and Big Dave's and Study Vegan, we both show that. All right. Well, this is a great conversation, and I wish both of you the best of luck. Uh, Derek Hayes there. He is the, co uh, the founder and uh, CEO at Big Dave's Cheesesteak and Pinky Cole, uh, the founder of Slutty Vegan. We'll be back in a moment. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Let's go to Wendy's here. We're going to stay with this fast food theme. Wendy's stock is up by about 1.7% uh, because the company is now saying there won't be surge pricing on its cheeseburgers and frosty milkshakes. This is following some backlash that the fast food chain has clarified some comments on its fourth quarter earnings call earlier this month about an upcoming dynamic pricing test. I feel like there's two parts to this. One is that companies are still getting squeezed, yeah. their input costs, and two, they're reaching the end of their pricing power. Okay, can we go back straight to this dynamic pricing? Yes. Because they keep saying they're walking this back. They keep saying, oh, they need to clarify. I went back through the transcript. Mm -hmm. It was very direct. They're thinking about testing dynamic pricing uh, in, in you know, some of their offerings here and that they were going to use AI to enable the menu changes and all this. I understand why they would say something like that, but it seems like they didn't necessarily think about the backlash to it. I mean, you have to think of ideas, right? Doesn't necessarily mean those ideas have to come to fruition. Doesn't mean you have to say it publicly on a conference call. Right, and then yeah. be surprised when there's a backlash from yeah. that. But I think the question is then, how do you protect your margins? Yeah. If you can't actually, because now we're all going to be focused on Wendy pricing, right? So now right. if you see a pricing come up a little bit, that's going to be an issue and a problem. Yeah. So now what do they do? And it's just, and it's weird too, because it would would really require a huge shift in consumer mindsets, at least when it comes to like fast food and restaurants. Mm -hmm. You, you kind of expect the price to be the price. If you go buy a burger from Wendy's today, when you go back tomorrow, you expect it to be the same price. You know, if it's, even if it's 10 cents higher, you might notice and you might think, why am I paying 10 cents more for something? That I paid 10 cents less for Which is interesting. Before. We were just talking to Derek about prices, and he's like, everything is still really high. Yeah. Versus you talk to other companies, like when we talked to Brett Shulman at Kava, he's like, no, prices are coming down a little bit, and that helps to offset the rise we've seen, say, in wages in California. Yeah. And But this is going to be, you're going to see this kind of juggling mm -hmm. act with a lot of these companies. Maybe not something as, as extreme as dynamic pricing, but companies really have to kind of figure out a way to do this. And, and you know, there were a lot of jokes saying that when you think about bars, for example, they've always had dynamic pricing. It's called happy hour or ladies' night or something like mm -hmm. that. They've always had ways to sort of get people in the door with better pricing. I don't know if this is exactly what Wendy's proposed. I think <laughs> what they did maybe took it a little bit too far. Or, or is it like, yeah. hey, if Frosties are in demand, let's jack up the price a buck uh, day to day. Anyway, still ahead. A conversation I, I with... I really go for no? a Frosty right now. I do like the Frosties. Yeah. Or I, I like DQ better. But uh, Marathon Asset Management Chairman uh, CEO Bruce Richards will be joining us next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Just about 3.30 p.m. here in New York. This is the countdown to the close. I'm Romaine Boston. And I'm Alex Steele. Nothing really happening in the market. So my question, yeah. if we get the PCE tomorrow, what's yes. going to be the PCE pain trade? Yeah, I think that's a big one. But here's the thing. I think mm. what's different about this report versus market position over the last reports, that you don't really have that extreme positioning that right. you had of the, uh, the last ones. This seems a little more measured, so maybe you don't get that extreme move. I mean, maybe CTAs and some leverage funds, you can yeah. see a little bit of short covering in mm. the Treasury market. But other yeah. than that, like... How lopsided is it, unless you're looking at massive downside for the equity market? Yeah. I don't know. And is it really going to move Fed pricing? I mean, Susan Collins and John Williams uh, spoke earlier today on their view on the path ahead for the Fed. Policymakers carefully assess the evolving data and outlook. I do want to see more evidence of that sustained trajectory um, and consistent with uh, projections from FOMC participants. I do believe it'll be appropriate to begin easing policy later this year. And when that happens, a methodical forward-looking approach to gradually re reducing rates should provide the necessary flexibility. Back in December, my colleagues and I put out what we call projections or forecasts. And the median was for three rate cuts this year uh, in, in 2024. We'll, we're data dependent. We're going to watch the data. I'm going to watch the data. A sign of success to me is that 
you know, with inflation coming down and the economy so, you know, so strong that we can, you know, be thinking about doing that, I would say later this year. Okay, so pushing rate, rate hike, rate cuts out and make me looking at three. Well, Bruce Richards, the Marathon Asset Management CEO and Chairman, and he joins us now. Bruce, good to see you. Hi, Alex. So I wonder, have we finally re-rated? Like, is the least dovish option now finally priced out of the market and the markets and the Fed finally on the same page? It's, I think what you said opening, like there's nothing to see here. Nothing to do in March, nothing to do in May. First cut in June, June 12th, mm -hmm. and probably three cuts this year. And what's gonna surprise the markets is not the three cuts, because they've already priced down from seven, six, five, four, and now they're at three. They're finally where the Fed wants them to be. And what I've been saying all along, three cuts. But what's gonna surprise you next is the Tennessee two-step. And what the Tennessee two-step is, I know I know you love your country western, <laughs> because you know, you're darling and you are Swifties now, and so you love your country western. What the Tennessee two-step is, is gonna move 75 base points and then he's gonna wait four meetings over six months. Ah. He's gonna wait and see, did the stimulus of lower rates do anything to reignite inflation? Did it do anything to re-stimulate GDP? And if it did, they have more to wait for, but it probably won't. And so after that first move and after that pause for four to six months, which no one's talking about in the marketplace, then it can resume bringing rates down to 3% where I think it eventually gets to Fed funds. So it's like when you went from zero to five and a quarter, mm -hmm. it was like driving from, I don't know, since we're talking about Tennessee, it's like driving from New York to see the Grand Ole Opry in, in Nashville, <laughs> right? But on the way back, on the drive back, really lots relax, of really, ch lots, lots of rest stops. Let's, let's, we'll, have, we'll have a dinner tonight, we'll stay at this hotel, we'll go see some friends in the morning, you know, before we continue on. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's gonna be, the two step. That's actually a really helpful way of looking at it now that I know what the two-step is. I'm gonna steal that. Uh, so I'm definitely, we're definitely gonna steal that. So based on that, where are the biggest dislocations that Bruce sees opportunity? Hmm. Well, first of all, I gotta remark how amazing the credit markets are and how amazing of a job Powell's done because here we are with higher rates and despite equities being relatively flat, they, they've been screaming. And so imagine the economy doing as well as it is that the fixed income markets have done as well as they have, and it's all doing quite well despite what is higher rates. And so, you know, what's the opportunity here with this type of environment? Well, I think first it starts with credit because it's higher for longer narrative, higher for now, and then when even they cut, higher for longer later mm. too. And that's really amazing because we earn like, you know, so for 530 plus five, six, 700 base points on yeah. a lot of our private credit investments, these are double digit returns. Yeah. We've never had a good all of us private credit lenders. And in the, in the credit markets as well, high yield leverage loans, emerging markets, structured credit, we're earning some really nice cash flow rates return. So yeah. we love that. And I'd start with that. Well, what about those certain pockets of that area right now? Because we talk about it from the umbrella basis and the return or the potential returns are certainly there. I don't know if the real estate crisis, if you will, I put it out in quotation marks, was ever resolved. But we do know there is still a bit of a refinancing cliff coming up for uh, a lot of commercial uh, tenant, commercial landlords, I should say, uh, and particularly in the office space. Yeah, so let's break it down for yeah. you. So there's about $21 trillion of value in commercial real estate. $21 trillion. Throughout the country, okay? But there's a huge debt problem. But you know something? There's only $5.6 trillion of debt. Mm. So when you think about it, there's two worlds. There's a world of $13 trillion of commercial real estate that doesn't have any debt on it, okay. and they're laughing. Their valuations are down a little bit, but they have no strain, no stress, not losing any sleepless nights, mm -hmm. nothing. Then there's $8 trillion of real estate that's levered up with $5.6 trillion of debt that's been provided to by various sources. And, and those folks are having a real problem because they bought in, these are the financial folks, at the big brilliant fund managers and real estate owner operators that use leverage to buy real estate. We all know who they are, and that's the world we all live in, mm -hmm. okay? And those folks are sweating it out okay. because valuations are down 20%, in some cases for office, 30, 40% or more, right. right? Valuations are down, financing costs are up, right. and the cash flows aren't there to support the amount of debt they have outstanding. And so there's multiple things that then that begs. Right. Number one is the banks, so you have 
all these banks, and like the top banks in this country, you know, the top 30 banks don't have a problem. The big banks that really matter don't have a problem. They only have 10% real estate exposure. Okay. But it's the other banks, and there's a few hundred of these other banks, the smaller and regional banks, that have like 40% real estate exposure mm -hmm. and, and, and debt. And they're the ones that you're going to see have the problems. And they're the ones that the FDIC, silent in the night, right. are going to come in and resolve those banks. So based on that scenario, do, do you embrace this sector from an investment perspective a little bit more or just kind of stay on the sidelines and see what oh, happens? Oh, absolutely yeah. embrace. There's, yeah. you know, 1,500 <laughs> different CM waiting for this moment. <laughs> You're right again. 1,561 CMBS transactions, 9,000 different tranches. We have them all modeled and we've been in buying the tranches that are dislocated, number one. Number two, we're buying loans from banks and from you know, the rates and, and providing some liquidity at discounts, of course, on their, some of their best assets because they sell their best assets first. Number three, these capital relief trades the banks need because of Basel III endgame coming. And finally, we're a lender, maybe last resort, but a lender at these higher rates on, on viable commercial real estate projects, whether it's development, whether it's refinancing, whether it's a new acquisition. And we're making really, really high rates returns mm -hmm. on these loans relative to what one made before, because a lot of the folks that are out there are impaired, buried under some of their portfolio, the workouts, yeah. and not in a position to be able to be a lender. So remain to your question, we love this environment. Mm -hmm. It's going to be tough for a lot of owner operators, but we're going to help through a lot of, you know, a lot of projects that need, you know, that extra capital to make it through. Mm -hmm. And we're very comfortable in that position. So before I let you go to that point, um, didn't we just see that article where someone sold an office tower for like a dollar? Yeah, so 360, yeah. you a guys heard about Bloomberg. Debt. Three, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So 360 Park Avenue yeah. South, yeah. 22, I think it's 22 story building, half a million square feet roughly. And the sponsors bought it for 300. Let me make sure I got my math right. 300 million dollars of of equity. They put 100 million dollars of capex into it to completely refurbish and and and, and rebuild out all the floors. Mm -hmm. So now they're in for 400, and they put 15 million dollars of debt service in. They're in for 415 million, and they have 200 million dollars of debt against that 415. The sponsor, the lead sponsor that owns this building just flipped it to his JV partner for a dollar just so he doesn't have to fund additional capital calls mm -hmm. because wow. it's burning cash to, to keep it going. And so, yeah, that's not one story. That's one of a thousand stories that are going to play out these next couple of years because to your point earlier, Romain, we can, and here's, here's a big point that no one's talking about, is we came into this year thinking 2024 would have about $540 billion of refinancings. Mm -hmm. Maturity walls. Mm -hmm. And the MBA, the Mortgage Bankers Association, mm -hmm. just printed a number of $900 billion. Wow. How do you go from $540 billion to $900 billion? Because it means a lot of the loans from last year didn't get refinanced, just got extended, amended, extended, or as you like to say, Alex, amend and pretend. Yeah. I say into, that. You oh, say that, I, or I say that. Okay, maybe. you say that. I say that. <laughs> <laughs> and amend and pretend into this year. So now the yeah. maturity wall is even bigger and more daunting than it's ever been. And that's why Bruce is so excited. Bruce, <laughs> hey, thanks for coming in. We really appreciate it. Come back next time. Bruce Richards, Marathon Asset Management CEO and Chairman. All right, coming up, you got Coinbase users getting quite a scare this afternoon after a glitch sewed a zero balance on some accounts. I got to be honest, that would have really freaked me out. It's the stock of the hour coming up next. This is The Close. This is Bloomberg. Let's get right to our stock of the hour, Coinbase. The shares have rallied more than 6% on the day and gave back almost all of those gains after a glitch on the system caused a lot of concerns here about what was going on on that platform. Shanali Bassett joining us right now to walk us through what happened, Shanali, and whether it's been fixed. Well, you have Brian Armstrong now taking to Twitter saying that the apps are recovering. What Coinbase had done is model a 10x surge, but this has been way more than that. Yeah. According to what Coinbase had tested, we know that Bitcoin, of course, is barreling way, well above 60,000. Coinbase, for its own right, is pairing its gains on the day. So just to be clear, though, they're saying that this was because of all the enthusiasm coming into the crypto space, specifically with Bitcoin, and they just couldn't handle it. it exactly. Okay. Right. Didn't they 
fix that to handle it? <laughs> this, How do this they is do the that? Thing. And the frustration, right? Remember, this is the largest U.S. crypto exchange that we are talking about. They are very upfront about this being because of a surge in activity around Bitcoin, but certainly uh, a lot of people answering and saying, if you just bought an ETF, you wouldn't have to handle that. So really the debate coming up once again with the largest U.S. crypto exchange yeah. uh, versus the new ETFs and what that means for Coinbase at the end of the day. Of course, Coinbase, for its own right, has been surging a lot off of increased activity, but on yeah. days like this, it's pretty tough. And we're posting, uh, we're showing uh, the post on, on X uh, social media platform. There was interesting, Altushana, there was a post by Citron Research basically saying go long Bitcoin, a short Coinbase, specifically citing uh, this outage here. I'm not sure if that's great advice or not, but it gets to the idea that this is how investors are going to start to look at this. Well, one big question around the ETF in particular is, interestingly, Coinbase is the custodian for a lot of the ETFs that are out there. Can Coinbase be making more and more money from businesses like that rather than the trading business? And if they were to lose some of the trading business here, because, you know, if you went on today to buy Bitcoin on a day where it's surging towards a new record high yeah. and facing problems around it, how does that impact your trading business moving forward? Now, again, they're experiencing so many so much versus trading volumes here that that's good for business, yeah. but will it reputationally hit them in the end? Right, or there's not that many places to go, so you just gotta suck it up and go. Um, Shanali, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it, Bloomberg. <laughs> Shanali Basic uh, joining you us do, there. You do great summations, by the way. Oh, do I? Yeah, I think if I ever have another, <laughs> you know, another life or something, I need someone to summarize everything for me. This is just you're me it. not having the tolerance. I hope you're very affordable. <laughs> All right, coming up, we're gonna take you down to closing bells. Sarah May, like Chief Investment Officer over at Nuveen, uh, will be joining us on this day where I gotta be honest, guys, nothing's happening. How we it up for tomorrow. This is Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. Romain Bostic alongside Alex Steele. Ten minutes until we get to the closing bells. Alex and S&P 500 down once again here. But I guess the bigger story is really the lack of volume and really just the lack of price action altogether. I mean, really, but for days. Yeah. And I, I, yeah. I know we're all going to pin it on PCE tomorrow, but yeah. I, I also am skeptical that that's going to be the mover that we're necessarily expecting it to be. Yeah, and it's kind of the sandwich, though. You go back to last week, you hit a record high, and then you have this big economic data point hanging over one's head. Maybe nobody really wants to get in between that until they see that report. Well, I'm true. What I'm interested in, though, um, is Apple, because it's sitting right at like $108, $180, mm. I should say. Yeah. Um, What's the significance of that? Well, I hear that it's in a level people care about. So, oh. But in theory, okay. it's going to shake out a lot of positions, and there'll be a lot of shorting that happens if Apple breaks below 180 That's like the word on the street. And if you just look at like a chart, you can see it's bumped up against that level for a bit, and we haven't broken through that uh, since late last year. So you wonder if there's a technical thing going on with Apple, and does that kind of bring down the rest mm. of the market? It, uh, if we melt down. Yeah, just taking a look at my terminal, 181 and change right now is the pivot point on the graph here. 179 and change right now is your first level of support on Apple. Those shares moving lower here on the day. A lot of questions right now about whether the rally is over or just simply taking a bit of a breather. Sarah Malik joining us right now, Chief Investment Officer at Nuveen to help us count down to the closing bell. And Sarah, you know there was so much cash that moved out of risk assets onto the proverbial sidelines. And despite the rally that we've seen over the last few months, not all of that cash has really been redeployed. Do you think we're going to start to see that, or did we kind of miss the moment? Well, there's still a lot of cash sitting on the sidelines, and I think we are seeing FOMO in some areas, such as Bitcoin. But you know, today markets are treading water for basically two reasons. One is PCE that's coming out tomorrow, and second, of course, is we have to ask ourselves, what's the catalyst post-earnings? I see three headwinds going forward from here. First is sticky, sticky inflation. Second is 10-year yields, which are up above 4%. And third is the election year, which should create excess volatility. Just starting with inflation, we have to ask ourselves after this January data, are we starting to see a second wave of sticky inflation? Also with the election year, 60% of GDP in 77 countries going to the polls, and also yields higher above 4% are a headwind for equities. Those are the things that I'm concerned about. Then I am curious for those folks who are maybe on the sidelines looking in, saying that maybe they do want to get reinvested in this market here, given the backdrop that you just painted here, what is the opportunity if there is one at all? Well, market timing, the issue is it tends to be a loser's game. This money's been sitting on the sidelines since before the beginning of last year. It's already missed out on a lot. So I think you need to average into the markets and just be selective. So within equities, even though we're cautious, there are areas such as public infrastructure, which tends to be a beneficiary of higher inflation because they can pass through costs and also more resilient 
during an economic downturn because of the nature of their business with waste management and utilities. Also within fixed income, high quality, high yield munis uh, look promising to us. The yields are attractive there. The states and their funds are in very good positions. And also in real assets, you can look to other areas uh, such as private credit, uh, which are also um, less diversified and less correlated. Uh, I mean, more diversified and less correlated with other asset classes. Uh, Sarah, a simple question, but what do you think it would take for the market to meaningfully go down? I think it's the economy and earnings that are the two areas that are holding the market up. So first, first starting with the economy, you know, we're looking at the consumer, employment, and manufacturing. Employment markets, of course, very strong. We've seen that with the payroll data. Consumer, I think, is a bit more shaky. Not only are delinquencies way up, we saw retail sales earlier this month, which came in under consensus. Consumer is starting to concern me. But on the other side, manufacturing data is starting to pick up. So all that together, the economy remains, remains strong. And as long as the economy can stay resilient in the face of higher rates and inflation, I think that's supported for the markets. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not worried about the economy today, but I am worried going forward that eventually uh, we will have to pay the price for these higher rates and in inflation. Which brings us back kind of full circle to the beginning of the show when we talked uh, about small caps and how sentiment was broadening out, that FOMO, the YOLO, as Romain had pointed out, was leading to more buying into small caps and mid caps. When I looked at small cap value versus growth, it was still growth. So in theory, it's weirdly still tech, even in the small cap space, that's outperforming, not the deep cyclicals. What do you do with the smaller guys? If you look at small caps, they're at some of their cheapest levels versus large cap that they've been in decades. Of course, the question is, what's going to be the catalyst? Will small caps revalue upward or will large cap just revalue downward? Small caps generally, uh, every decade since the 1930s, have beaten inflation. So if we are back to this er period of sticky inflation, uh, almost a second wave of inflation, I think that could be positive for small caps, especially if, if the economy stays strong. You know, what the Fed is looking for with inflation is for disinflation to broaden out. And right now, we're just not seeing that with services inflation and with wage inflation. That's what's concerning. I think we'll see more of that tomorrow with the PCE data, but then we'll have to see what February and March brings to see if January was an anom anomaly with higher inflation or not. Does that, how much is that going to matter, though, for investors on the point about disinflation not necessarily being disinflationary enough? As long as we don't necessarily see a material reacceleration in inflation, shouldn't that at least be enough to placate them? Well, one thing is it comes down to Fed rate cuts. As we, we came into the beginning of this year, we investors were expecting seven rate cuts. We've always been in the camp of about three rate cuts for this year. The uh, market has been pricing those out. The market now agrees about three rate cuts this year. But if we do have more of a second wave of inflation rather than just sticky level inflation, I think then more rate cuts could get priced out of the markets. Fed tends to do less during election years rather than more. So mm -hmm. you get, could even get to this narrative of higher inflation, a strong economy, and yeah. those rate cuts, not only don't, are they not three, they might become zero. And you could even lo be looking at a rate hike later this year. I think that would concern the markets. One last quick question, and this is about uh, geopolitics and specifically here in the U.S. with the election. I know typically we tend to see an uptick in volatility, but at least here in the U.S., uh, there's not as much drama around this election as in years past. We already know who the nominee is going to be. Uh, uh, pretty much, uh, I think we can pretty much assume who the two nominees are going to be. And they're both sort of known quantities, right? We're not going into this election scratching our head saying who is who. Is there just the potential that maybe that keeps the volatility a bit more in check? Well, in a normal election year, volatility tends to be up about 10 percent higher. So we're already going to have a more volatile year if we just have a typical year. Now we have 60 countries going to the polls. I think there's two other factors, though, governance in different countries around the world and also misinformation with artificial intelligence. I think that could be another factor that impacts what's going around, on around the election. So if I'm betting, I'm saying volatility is going to be on uh, above 10 percent higher than the usual because of what's going on with the number of elections and also the amount of misinformation that could be spread around. Sarah, always wonderful to talk to you. Sarah Malik, Chief Investment Officer at Nuveen, helping us count down to the closing bells here on this Wednesday afternoon with just about three minutes to go. Alex, stocks are pretty much where they were, well, when we started the show, which is fractionally lower here on the day. Still seeing a modest bid, though, into some of those mid-cap names, so some people still finding buying opportunities, just not in big cap. Yeah, I also love when you brought up the Goldman Sachs uh, tactical strategist, right? And yeah, we saw yeah. it from HSBC also. Mm -hmm. Sentiment's not great. We are all overbought, but there's no catalyst to go down. And then you have Barclays, UBS, uh, was it Credit Suisse? Did they all upgrade uh, their S&P target? Yeah, for everybody year, is bumping it up now. And I know, they're chasing. But I thought that idea, is, it's a good idea, but it gets to this idea of maybe there's a floor. Maybe we're not going to talk about another 10, 20% rally, but... 
the worst case scenario, which is everyone thought we would see a sell off, at least for right now, not seeing much evidence of that as you move closer to the closing bell. Stick with us. We're going to take you to the bell and beyond. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Alex Steele. We're counting you down to the closing bell. You're here to help take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast. Joined right now in Studio 2 by Scarlett Fu and in our radio booth with Carol Masser and Tim Senevic. We bring together our audiences across all of our Bloomberg platforms, Carol Masser, including studio. Carol Masser, those folks still streaming us on YouTube. Bonjour, Carol Masser. Bonjour. You know, we're a little obsessed. This has nothing to do with the markets because I'm just waiting for the inflation print tomorrow. But this surge pricing at Wendy's, have you guys been talking about this at all? We did. Yeah, yeah all day long, Carol. It's, it's all anyone wants to talk about. It's have you have you prank. gone to Wendy's lately? You don't seem like a Wendy's person. I'm a McDonald's french fries kind of person and a Happy Meal. Sure. And that kind of makes me very just, happy. Just so you all know, <laughs> Carol is very anti-surge pricing. <laughs> She doesn't well, think it's fair. I well, I'm with Carol up, on this one. I, I think this is the worst idea in the world. Oh but, my you know. God. I think I think a lot of people agree with you. I will point out though that it's kind of happens already when it comes to specials on Monday nights and you know trying to get people through the door That's to a restaurants. It's discount. It's not surge pricing. This is at Wendy's. It's, it's dynamic. No, oh. no, not at Wendy's, oh, okay. but restaurants. It's, I didn't know Wendy's is, was like it that. It is dynamic, right? I'm mad at Tim. I'm not talking to him right now. What's a happy hour? Trying to justify it. What's a happy hour? Discounted beers. Did they clarify that there won't be dynamic pricing? They did. They did clarify. That clear, well, uh, hang on now, because I'll push back on that. <laughs> they, they, they clarified it, but then if you go back and look at the transcript, right. they said it. And they right. said it very directly. So to say that we need to clarify it was, let's just say, a little um, disingenuous. What about exactly. more yeah. flexibility? The company says that the new boards will Corporate give them more speak. flexibility to display Corporate featured speak. items. More flexibility to make more money. They need money, man. Okay. They're going right. to pay people to need the money. Uh. All right. God bless Wendy's. They have great frosties, <laughs> but you know what? If it goes up 10 cents, I'm not buying it. All right, let's get you uh, the closing uh, bill here uh, in New York. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, as are most of the indices out there, are going to finish the day in the red. The Dow only fractionally lower, a 23-point loss, only about a tenth of a percent in the hole. The S&P going to finish the day down by about eight points or two-tenths of a percent, while the Nasdaq Composite and the Nasdaq 100 each down by about a half a percentage point on the day. And the Russell 2000, that's your primary laggard here on the day, down 16 points or eight-tenths of a percent. All right, back to the S&P 500 we go. Looking at uh, names to the upside, Scarlett, 250 57 to the downside 244 so kind of an even split there kind of an even split but when you look at the IMAP and you look at how the sectors uh, break down you have a lot more gainers than decliners among the 11 industry groups REITs are in the lead gaining more than one and a quarter percent financials and consumer discretionary also higher thanks to eBay for that consumer discretionary push uh, and on the downside you have communication services that's Alphabet and the ad agencies tech lower by six tenths of one percent and the healthcare index losing about half of one percent because of United Health. All right, we got some earnings uh, crossing the wire here. Going to get quite a few here in after hours trading. Paramount uh, just out here uh, crossing the wire. And it looks uh, overall like some of the numbers are coming in a little bit light here. I'm going to read you the revenue number first for the fourth quarter. $7.6 billion. The street was looking for about $7.9 billion. So a miss on the top line. On the bottom line, the company says adjusted EPS on a continuing operating basis. An important number here was $0.04 cents a share. The street was basically looking for less than $0.01 cents a share. So a beat on that. That measure, but let's face it, folks, this isn't really about the numbers. This is really about what they plan to do with the company. Not seeing any headlines cross the wire just yet as to whether they're still in talks with anyone and what they plan to do next. Carol. Got to go to Salesforce, man. Just watching the stock in the aftermarket. It is bouncing around right now down about 1.8 percent. But let's get to some of the key headlines. First of all, beginning a quarterly dividend of 40 cents a share. So we did see, I feel like, a pop on that. Also, a share buyback authorization increased by $10 billion. So talk about catching our attention. Uh, also with the outlook, uh, Salesforce seeing first quarter adjusted EPS of $2.37, $2.37 a share to $2.39 a share. The estimate on the street is $2.19. The stock, though, is down right now about 4% here in the aftermarket. If I go back to the fourth quarter, revenue $9.29 billion. That was slightly above the estimate of $9.22 billion. And fourth quarter adjusted EPS of $2.29. Uh, the estimate, that's two pennies better than the uh, estimate. But again, the outlook looks up. Beat uh, doing the buyback authorization, increasing it by $10 billion, and then quarterly dividend. Uh, nonetheless, the stock, like I said, 
bouncing around uh, now down about 5% here in the aftermarket. Yeah, those two things, uh, CEO and Chair Mark Benioff pointed to in the press release saying that he's thrilled to initiate our first ever Salesforce dividend and increase our share buyback plan by $10 billion. Uh, he also did say, uh, he, he, he is highlighting uh, the Einstein One platform, saying that he's well positioned, Salesforce is, to build on the success and capitalize on the massive surge in tech spending expected over the coming years, delivering an unprecedented level of intelligence to our customers as AI transforms every company and industry. You know, have you noticed a trend since Meta announced a dividend that every tech company, or not every tech company, but it's become very fashionable for these tech companies to launch a dividend? Uh, it's worked out well for Meta, certainly. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. But I just wanted to point out that Weight Watchers International, or as the company is now known as WW International, has um, announced earnings as well. And uh, one of the big headlines, of course, because Oprah Winfrey owns a big stake in it, is that she is part of a board transition. She has decided not to stand for re-election. Oh. She has served on the company's board since 2015. Yeah. All right. In terms of the numbers, loss per share, $1.11. That is larger than what analysts had anticipated, which was a $0.07 cent share share, uh, loss per share of seven cents. Uh, revenue for the quarter, $206 million, slightly lower than what was expected, which was $206.9 million. Net subscription revenue of $196.1 million, a little bit higher than what analysts were looking for. Yeah, going to that WW, that's a pretty big thing. Remember several years ago, um, she has served on the company's board of directors since 2015. She says, I look forward to continuing to advise yeah. and collaborate with Weight Watchers and the company's CEO. But big change. We know yeah. there's been a lot going on with this company. So. Yeah, and you remember when she joined the board, I mean, that was really kind of the rocket launch of WW when she took that stake and joined the board. It'd be interesting to see what the next chapter is there. Some other earnings out as well. This on the software company, Okta, shares higher by about 14% here and after hours, trading on the back of some really strong guidance. The company says that first quarter adjusted EPS will come in at 54 to 55 cents a share. The street was looking for 42 cents a share. It also says revenue will come in at about 603 to 605 million. The street was looking for 585. We should also point out that the four Q numbers, also a big beat there, 63 cents on adjusted EPS for the quarter, guys, versus an estimate of 51. Yeah, also waiting for Snowflake talking about software, guys. But going back to Salesforce for a second, that stock is now up by about 5.5%. But I want to point out with these companies, they had an enormous run. So I appreciate the fact that uh, you're looking at 2025 sales forecast trailing estimates, but still, uh, Snowflake is out. So just a quick moment on that. Fourth quarter revenue beating estimates. Uh, earnings per share on a diluted basis also coming in better than estimated at 35 cents. Uh, revenue came in at 700 uh, million, but that stock is down uh, at 15%. CEO is also apparently Big stepping news. down. Snowflake has said mm. right now that Frank Slootman has decided to retire as chief executive officer, uh, and they have named a replacement. Uh, Sridhar Ramaswamy, I hope I get that name pronounced correctly, has been named the new CEO over there. Effective immediately. Yeah, Slootman will uh, continue to serve as chairman of the board. We should note shares of Snowflake down 15% uh, in after hours right now. Fourth quarter revenue uh, coming in above estimates, uh, uh, 774.7 million versus estimates of 760.4 uh, yeah. million. And we should point out, I mean, Slootman hadn't been there that long. I think he joined right before the pandemic uh, from mm. uh, and Blackstone. He, he had a huge, compensation, really well. a huge yeah. compensation package early on yeah. in Snowflake's life as a public company. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so Snowflake down about 17% here in the aftermarket. Shares of Salesforce, Salesforce, if I may go back to that for just a moment, big player, obviously, it's still down about four or five uh, percent despite um, putting out a dividend and also upping its buyback plan. So we'll continue to look for some more uh, color in terms of uh, some concerns maybe about that company. Maybe it's just not enough. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, there's a big question mark when it comes to Salesforce on whether it's going to be a double-digit revenue growth company or a single digit. And the latest numbers, at least for the fourth quarter, indicate that it is um, in the low double digits. Do, so does that qualify, to, I mean, to I, get it out of that, that slump? I am curious, though, about all these software companies overall, because we talk about where uh, right now, at least the ones that, that deal mainly with enterprise spending, where corporate spending is right now. And I know Salesforce is kind of its own animal, but when you look at kind of these second-tier software names like an Okta, like a Snowflake, you kind of wonder what their future is if we are seeing a material softness there. Yeah, I think there are a lot of questions about um, the hardware versus software when it comes to the AI transformation. Um, we just spoke to a guest about this who said that this, the hardware companies mm -hmm. uh, are, are is where all the spend is happening right now. I mean, look at NVIDIA, for example, and that's why he's bullish on those. Hey, I'm looking at shares of uh, C3 AI in the after hours right now. They are moving higher right now by 15%. The company did report its latest results. Um, getting the numbers now, uh, subscription revenue did beat estimates for the company uh, up uh, to uh, $70.4 million. Estimate was for 
66.6 million dollars. Um, revenue coming in above uh, at 78.4 million estimates for 76.1 million dollars in the third quarter. All right, and just real quickly on Salesforce, uh, it looks like that 2025 sales forecast really trailing some of the estimates that are out there. So maybe some disappointment. And thanks for the dividend, thanks for the buyback, but just not enough. All right, guys, a lot of stocks moving to the downside. Snowflake down about 21% in the aftermarket. That's a wrap. Our cross platform, a lot of earnings after the close across platform on radio, TV, YouTube, Bloomberg Originals. We call it Beyond the Bell. We will see you same time, same place tomorrow. And right here on Bloomberg Television, we are going to continue to break down those earnings. Those are the big movers in after hours trading. Okta, the biggest gainer out there. Snowflake, the biggest decliner. Salesforce down 5%. Stick with us. Full coverage coming up when we come back after the break right here on The Close on Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. I'm Scarlett Fu with Romaine Bostic. When it comes to the equity market trade today, it really feels like we are marking time until PCE drops tomorrow uh, at 8.30 a.m. So in the meantime, you have a decline of two-tenths of 1% for the S&P 500. The Magnificent Seven losing more ground off by more than half of 1%. But that group no longer trades as a monolith, right? You've got NVIDIA, Meta, Amazon, and Microsoft, and then everyone else. The 10-year yield, little change here, down marginally by almost four basis points to 4.26%. And Bitcoin earlier today surpassed $60,000 for the first time in two years. The next stop, of course, is $69,000. It's record high set back in late 2021. And of course, what's helping drive the gains of that cryptocurrency is the successful launch of the spot Bitcoin ETFs, such as iBit, the iShares Bitcoin Trust. You can see it gaining 5.7% on the day. Uh, the latest data show that this ETF saw a record $520 million of inflows yesterday. And of course, we have other crypto-related companies like MicroStrategy and Coinbase advancing as well. Constellation Energy finishing the day up almost 10%, extending its advance from yesterday after its EBITDA for the fourth quarter beat analyst estimates. What's notable here is that Constellation Energy has actually outperformed NVIDIA so far uh, this month. Fancy that. All right, and we also want to look at some decliners here. Apple staying above $180, but down by seven-tenths of 1%. In fact, over the past two and a half weeks, it's risen only three times, closed higher three times. In terms of the technicals, 180 is a key level that we're watching for. The stock is already trading below its 200-day moving average. If it does fall below $180, a lot of people are saying that the short sellers may pounce. And United Health dragging the healthcare group lower overall, losing about 3% on the day. It's the worst performer in the Dow Industrials. Bloomberg has learned that the Department of Justice Justice launched an antitrust investigation into the company after a string of acquisitions over the last two years. United Health declined to comment. Romain? All right, let's get back to some of the earnings out there, including from several software companies and the biggest of them all, Salesforce, out with its latest results here. In the most recent quarter, the company reported adjusted EPS of $2.29 a share. That was an increase on a year-over-year -year basis and above street estimates. Revenue told a similar story, and the company gave a forecast here on the full year for 37.7 to about $38 billion in revenue. Ed Ludlow joining us right now, the co-host of Bloomberg Technology, to walk us through the numbers. Ed, what was the, uh, the biggest thing that jumped out at you in this report? Yeah, it's the outlook for fiscal 25, and I think you guys nailed it, that with, with Salesforce, the story is that the walk doesn't match the talk. So if you look at the, the press release, they're talking about an expected surge in tech spending. <laughs> But even the top end of their forecasted sales range is below consensus estimates. And it's important to get really detailed on that. So what they're saying is that revenue for the full year fiscal 25 will grow by 10.81%. But actually, because they outperformed in the, the final three months of last year, that would represent decelerating growth. And the AI story for them is that they do all these different things, right? CRM, cloud-based software support. Yeah. But... The main thing is that there's no evidence that those higher priced AI tools are contributing to growth on the top line. And Scarlett, you nailed it. This is a company that has historically grown 20 to 25% every year for the last decade. It's continuing on a downward trajectory back towards single digit growth, which is worrying. Absolutely. You look at the numbers uh, so far in fiscal 2024. First quarter, 11% revenue growth. Second quarter, 11% revenue growth. Third quarter, 11% revenue growth. So it's kind of stuck at that level and perhaps um, just 
delivering along those lines is not enough to impress or satisfy a lot of investors. Of course, we have to mention the dividend that it's initiated yes. and the <laughs> stock buyback. Um, is that enough to buy it time? It doesn't look like well, it right now in early trading. It's not do yeah, it's not doing Salesforce a lot of good in the moment. But it's so interesting because you know we talk about artificial intelligence in this earnings period. I call it the artificial sweetener. Look at how many companies uh, did a dividend. And in Salesforce's case, it's a dividend for the first time, just 40 cents um, uh, 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 this time around, and boosting the buyback by $10 billion. But a lot of companies have done that, yeah. and, and investors have really cheered it. It's not enough in Salesforce case to mask the deceleration in top yeah. line growth. Salesforce shares down about 5% here in after hours trading. We're going to keep an eye uh, on that uh, stock, of course, as we have more earnings crossing the wire right now, including from HP Inc., HPQ, the ticker revenue coming in in the most recent quarter. Slightly below street estimates, 13.2 billion. The street was looking for 13 and a half. Adjusted EPS coming in pretty much on the nose, but the guidance going forward looking a little bit light, particularly for that fiscal second quarter. Those shares down 7%. All right, we do want to turn uh, for a second to the broader market and really the broader economy. And who better to do that with than with Christopher Ailman? He's the chief investment officer over at CalSTRS, joining us here in. Uh, I guess a somewhat warm New York City, not quite California warm, but uh, no. <laughs> but uh, we'll take it. Uh, Chris, I, you know, we, we talked, we started off this show about an hour ago, talking about kind of how retail investors have started to maybe dip their toe back into the pool. All the cash that's on the sideline, six trillion or whatever, depending on what number you believe. I mean, even Warren Buffett has what, a couple hundred exactly. billion on the sidelines that he can't find anything to do with here. What, what gets that money off the sidelines, if at all? I don't know that it needs to. Yeah. And if it does, it's going to be a market decline of at least 20 percent before people like Warren Buffett mm -hmm. and even us are going to come running back in. Mm -hmm. Market timing is way too hard. So the retail investor is always late. Mm -hmm. This market's hit record highs. But look at those two stocks you just mentioned. They yeah. missed by a little. I'm sorry, 11 percent growth. Charlotte, that's a problem. You know, but it, they're getting punished. Yeah. So the expectation is for perfection, yeah. which is unrealistic. But, this but market could stay up for a while. Though. It's unrealistic. But I mean, to go back to Buffett, I mean, who is obviously the longest of long term investors, as as you are at Calsters uh, for any pension fund here. If he can't find a long term investment prospect, at least that in his view is valuable or, or of a, a relative value, then what does that mean for the rest of us? I think yeah. he's spot on. I mean, yeah. Warren is always patient. He's yeah. getting 5% on his cash, yeah. which is billions on his cash yeah. pile. He owns world-class companies. And right now, the market is overpriced on everything. So nothing is at a discount. I mean, he's famous, as you said. If people are greedy, he's going to be worried. Mm -hmm. He's going to wait till people are worried to be greedy. And mm -hmm. right now, this kind of a market is, I'm patient to sit back. We earn a nice return on our cash. We're doing well in bonds. We're diversified. We're fully invested. We'll just sit back and let this go. And if there is any kind of a pullback in the market, then we would come in. But you don't, I don't foresee one. We hit the soft landing. We're OK. We did? We're, this yeah. is the yeah. soft landing. Okay. This is as good as it gets. Yeah. The Fed raised rates to 5.5. Yeah. They can ease back down yeah. maybe 475, like yeah. they've said. And things are OK. The economy, look, the market's hitting yeah. record highs. The economy is OK. So when we say soft landing, that means an economic slowdown, but no recession and therefore no market crash. Down the road, does anyone ever actually remember these soft landings? <laughs> no, because we haven't had one before. That's why it like, mm, remains so shocked. This is the soft landing. I, I didn't know I could expect it. And I think that's just it. The average consumer doesn't feel really good. And right. it's amazing when you talk to people in the street, yet they're still shopping. They're still hitting the airports. They're still going out to dinner. And so the economy, as you know with the numbers, is okay, not super strong. So he pulled off, inflation slowed without causing a recession. Now the question is, inflation is going to be sticky. Yeah. What's the normal interest rate? And I think it's 3 to 5%, somewhere in this range. Well, people are spending, but they're reluctantly spending and doing so with, you know, with a grimace. I want to go back to the companies that did report. You mentioned Salesforce and that 11% sales growth. Um, what about this idea that they're now paying dividends? For long-term investors, for those who focus on dividend-paying companies, is that enough to entice them to, to buy into some of these tech companies that are very highly valued and perhaps a little too rich for their like, liking, but are paying regular dividends. I'm going to go back to Warren Buffett. That's the point of corporate ownership, is that I get a share of the earnings of a company. Now, many of them have grown so fast, they think the best thing to do is to plow it back into the company and grow it OK. Mm. I'll let the board decide. But yes, I want to see dividends, because that's a part of stock ownership. It's not all capital appreciation. 
look at all the AI boom that we've had. Wall Street is saying that AI is going to be profitable and a huge productivity gain. I hope they're right. I think they're overshooting, but you know, right now AI is an expense and we're seeing some earnings from it. And the Magnificent Seven, or as you said, the four are doing very, very well. The other stocks, I think it's interesting, really are tailing off and having a tougher time, as you would expect. Chris, always great to talk to you. Christopher Elman there. He is the CIO over at Calsters, more than $300 billion uh, under uh, his watch. All right, coming up here, he was just talking about AI. We're going to talk about a new AI tool that could actually be a game changer for doctors. The details coming up next right here on The Close on Bloomberg. Some headlines out of Electronic Arts, the video game publisher. It is restructuring its uh, staff. It's going to affect about 5% of employees. So it's announcing job cuts in a letter to employees, cutting about 5% of its workforce. It will take charges of about $125 million to $165 million. You can see the stock moving slightly higher in the after hours trade on this announcement. All right. Uh, tomorrow. The academic publishing giant Elsevier is launching a new AI medical search tool to help doctors. It's called Clinical Key AI. The company, best known as the publisher of Gray's Anatomy, is partnering with Open Evidence to roll out the technology to America's large hospital systems. Joining us now for an exclusive interview is Jan Herzog, president of Elsevier's global healthcare business. Jan, great to have you here on the program. There, you. As you know, there's been so much talk about AI, but when we talk about the substance of it and the practical applications of it. We've heard a lot from folks in the medical community, drug makers who say this will help them speed up drug discovery. And now with this new tool, explain exactly what this does for the doctors and what's the primary benefit. Thank you so much for, me, for having me here today. So as you mentioned, or as you know, um, probably Elsevier is part of the broader WellEx company, a FTSE 100 company. Uh, we have launched several AI products recently, one in legal, uh, for lawyers, one for researchers, and now the latest one is with clinical key AI in mm -hmm. the medical field. We are very excited about this launch that's happening tomorrow because what it does is it combines the most cutting edge and trusted based content with um, a very, very strong search engine powered mm -hmm. by uh, large language models. Where is that content coming from? The content is from our very large database of content that we have published over all these years. Um, they are the latest journals, articles, the latest trust-based content mm -hmm. from books, from drug information, drug monographs, and all of that combined. I mean, our, com our customers, the clinicians, thousands of clinicians globally and hospital systems trust this content. And we combine this content with a very, very high-quality vector search that picks out the right pieces of content mm. based on the question that the clinician has. Yeah, that's a big question, I think, for everyone in terms of where, that, where you're sourcing that information. I'm curious about what mistakes Clinical Key AI has made so far and what you're doing to fix those errors. Yeah, so great question, Scarlett. So when I look at the, from an architecture perspective, what we are doing is it's very different to many, many other products on the market. What it does is it really has only the content, the trusted content that we, uh, we have curated over all these years, where it takes the search and power, basically there's a search on top that pulls that content out. So hallucination is very, very, very limited. Now, what, it, what we do to ensure that the quality is very high, so one is based on the architecture, another one is we have a very, very sophisticated evaluation framework where we have hundreds of clinicians constantly also checking the answers and the results have been phenomenal. What kinds of questions is clinical AI key very good at answering that, that you can't get otherwise? Yeah, so we have, when you look at from a clinician, what they do is they have three types of questions usually. One could be very, very simple, uh, very much drug-related questions that every, cl every clinician has all the time in relation to a patient. Mm. Um, these are the questions they still take about four minutes usually to find an answer to. We help with clinical key AI to find this information in seconds, very, very fast. Now, then there are questions that are more difficult. They are more related to comorbidities. Um, more where you have multi-drugs, for example, that you use. And their clinical key AI is extremely powerful because what it does is it does something that a clinician 
cognitively would be very difficult to find an answer to is it goes through all these different databases and searches for it and pulls out that particular answer to that question. And that's where it's extremely powerful. And the response, the feedback that you've gotten in the testing phase from the hospitals, doctors, et cetera, that's been positive? Has been phenomenal. So and what we have is we have several development partners we've yeah. been working with, Cone Health, uh, University of New Mexico, and in fact, more than 30,000 physicians across the United States have used the underlying technology. Jan, really appreciate your joining us and uh, telling us more about this tool. Jan Herzhoff of Elsevier joining us Thank today. You. All right, we've got a lot more coming up on the close. Starbucks and its main union have agreed on a path forward, so it's a pivot here. Up next, we're going to speak with one of the lead organizers from Workers United, Michelle Eisen. This is the close on Bloomberg. season doesn't end. A number of companies out with their results in the last couple of minutes. So here now to take us through some of those results are Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle, Alexandra Semenova, and Isabel Lee. Abigail? Options pricing works, Scarlett, because coming into WW International's quarter, options were suggesting a move of, an implied move of 28%. Now, when I last looked at the stock, it was down only 12%. Now it's down 24%, pretty close to that mark. So what happened here was subscriptions were better, uh, but they put up a much wider loss in the quarter that was of $1.11 versus the estimate of uh, seven, a loss of $0.07, cents, so a, a really wide miss there. 2024 revenues, a range of $830 million to 860 missing the mark, the estimate of $922.3 million. So from a numbers perspective, not great. And then from a headline optics perspective, not great either. Oprah Winfrey has decided not to stand for re-election. She has been on the board since 2015. She's saying that she will still advise and collaborate, but still the fact that she's no longer on the board, I think investors probably not taking kindly to that. In the month of February alone, there's a very volatile stock making uh, 13, 12, I should say, moves of greater than 5% up or down. But this is definitely the worst, or actually I shouldn't say definitely. We'll wait until tomorrow. But I believe, strongly believe, this is the worst uh, move if it holds into the open tomorrow of 2024. Alex, what are you taking a look at? Hey, Abby, I'm taking a look at shares of Paramount and Global, which are down in after hours trading. This is after the media giant reported fourth quarter revenue that missed the average Wall Street estimate. The parent company of networks like CBS, MTV, and others said fourth quarter sales fell 6% to $7.64 billion. Now, despite the revenue miss, the company posted better than expected earnings of four cents a share, excluding some items. Wall Street had expected a break even quarter. Now, taking a look at some of the other metrics. Param subscribers to its Paramount Plus streaming service rose 4 million from the prior quarter to 67 million. Advertising at Paramount's traditional TV business fell 15%, however, as consumers cut back on cable spending. Paramount's namesake, namesake film studio struggled as well, with sales down 31%. Isabel, what are you looking at? Thanks, Alex. We have big news from Snowflake. The company announced a management change, so it named Sudhara Maswami as its new CEO. He follows Frank Slootman, who will still stay on as chairman of the board. Sudhara Maswami was most recently the senior vice president of AI, and he joined in May 2023 after the company acquired Neva. So he previously held all of Google's advertising products, so that's a big deal. But on to the earnings front, we see shares now falling in post-market trading almost 23%. Earlier it was around 25%, and it's really because of a miss. So in the fourth quarter, Snowflake reported revenue that beat estimates. It's up 32% year over year, but it's in the outlook for the first quarter that missed estimates and spook investors. So the firm saw that firm sees product revenue at 745 million to 750 million, that's below estimates. They also eye an operating margin of adjusted 3%. And for the 2025 outlook, it's also a miss. And they're eyeing adjusted operating margin of 6%. And other related stocks like Datadog, MongoDB, and Cloudflare are also sliding. But we have year-to-date shares of Snowflake up around 
12% and for the past 12 months up 50%. Back to you, Romaine. All right, thanks to Isabel, Alexandra, and uh, Abigail there. A lot of big movers here in after hours trading, and that includes AMC. Those shares down about 9%. Those earnings just crossing the wire. Now, in the quarter, they did see 12% growth in revenue. That was good. They also did see, well, an increase in actual attendance, up about 5%. But that did not translate into profitability. 54 cents a loss per share. Now, the street was looking for 67 cents of the loss per share. Now, that would seem like a beat, but when you back in some of those items here, they actually miss big time here on that bottom line number. And when you look at the actual dollar value, $42.5 million on an EBITDA basis, that came in a little bit like the street was looking for roughly about $48. Million. All right, we're going to try to get you some more details on some of those big movers, but we do want to go back to a story that broke yesterday, and it's a big win for labor relations here in the U.S. Starbucks has committed to working with its main union in order to end hostilities and hash out a fair process for labor organizing. The coffee chain announced it will start providing Workers United's members with benefits such as credit card tipping that it previously restricted to non-union stores. For more on this, we're joined by Michelle Eisen. She's a 13-year Starbucks barista in Buffalo, New York, and she was a leader of Starbucks' Workers United movement. And I do want to go back to the start of that movement, Michelle. There was, on total, I think, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, you've got about 400 stores now that have effectively been unionized. But as of yesterday, we hadn't really seen a meaningful sort of push to actually get a contract and ratify those contracts with Starbucks. Does yesterday's announcement by Starbucks push us further in that direction? I think it does. It's a, it's a major step in the direction that we've been hoping to move in for, for well over two years now. Um, and it's, it's exciting. It's exciting to see that. Why do you think that they came around, given how much they fought, given all of the animosity, at least publicly, that we've seen? What was the pivot? Why? I don't know that we'll ever know what exactly tipped the scale. I mean, we've we've been fighting for two and a half years. I don't think we've let up. Um, we did file last week, uh, you know, a week ago yesterday for 21 new stores. You know, so maybe it was the, the acknowledgement that we weren't going away. What I what I hope that it was is that um, within the company, they've come to the conclusion that, you know, aside from from at ending any hostility or animosity, as you stated, that this is actually the best path forward for the company itself as well. And I, I hope that is the case. Also, there's the idea that personnel is policy, right? Because under the previous CEO, Howard Schultz, he was firmly against any kind of unionizing, whereas you have a new CEO, Laxman Naras, uh, Narasimhan, who uh, has indicated that he's a little bit more flexible. How much do you credit the new CEO for paving the way uh, to a breakthrough in these discussions? I think he absolutely deserves credit. I mean, he is the CEO. There's no way that a decision like this is made without, at the very least, his input. But I'm assuming his his sort of seal of approval. Um, and we're thankful for that. We're looking forward to building that relationship, the relationship that you know the hourly workers have wanted with the company for a very long time. I don't want to plant seeds of doubt, but do you worry that there's a catch in here at all? Um, you know what? I'm not. I'm not worried about that right now. And I know that might sound naively optimistic, but I've been doing this for a long time at this point, you know, from the very first store. And I think that until I'm presented with evidence that the company is not proceeding in good faith, mm -hmm. I think that we have to give the benefit of the doubt and acknowledge that both sides are ready to, you know, it's a new day. We're ready for changes. We're ready to move forward. When we talk about sort of how significant this is for the broader labor movement. As you know, we went through several major strikes in other industries, uh, several major labor victories in other industries. But that was also an economy and a job market that really did favor the worker. Do you worry at all that the bloom has come off the rose of that and the leverage that workers and their unions might have might not necessarily be as strong in 2024 and beyond as it was the last couple of years? I certainly hope not. I mean, in terms of a, a business like Starbucks, Starbucks needs their hourly workers. The, the stores don't function without us. Um, so in, at least in the case of Starbucks, they're always going to need the worker. They're always going to need those of us who go to those shops every day and, and run them and, you know, know those, have those connections with their customers and build those relationships. Um, so it, at least in our instance, I don't think that's the case. I think the company recognizes how important 
uh, the, the hourly worker is in their business model, in their business overall, and they're willing to, to look at that from a new perspective. And I think that that should be applauded. I know that there's still a lot of work that needs to be done and you'll be working on this framework and finalizing, but right now what seems to be unaddressed is the campaign for three seats on the Starbucks board. Is this a red line for, for your side? Actually, I don't know that any sort of decisions have been made on either side of that since yesterday's news has broke. There's still, you know, we are hashing this out day by day. People are, are working furiously to try to see what still sits and what, what gets to fall away because of this new news. Um, and I think that once an announcement has been made, we would be fine sharing that. I just don't even think we've made a decision. Right. But how high of a priority is it for your side? Well, I mean, the hope was that this would help move the company in the direction of of where we are right now. And oh. we've have we have reached that point. So I don't know. I, I'm not really sure, at least where we have decided that still ranks in our in our um, scenario here. Got it. Well, once you do, please come back and let us know. Michelle Eisen of Starbucks Workers United joining us, uh, of course, long time. Uh, unionist for the company uh, in Buffalo. All right. We uh, also want to give you a recap of what happened in the market today. And Romain was kind of a yawn, given that we're waiting for PCE data tomorrow that's uh, likely to move the market, give us a better idea of what the Fed does next. Uh, the S&P 500 inching lower by two tenths of one percent. The Magnificent Seven inching a little bit more lower, losing six tenths of one percent. Yeah, you did see a little bit more activity uh, in the bond market and in the option space here. I don't know how much of a game changer that PCE data is going to be, particularly if it's not a blowout number either mm -hmm. up or down. If it just kind of comes in line, is that kind of the wah-wah trombones or or are people, or is that maybe the reset? If right. People just want to make sure that we're not seeing the disinflation story disappear. Well, one thing that is has been serving as a catalyst is Bitcoin. Look at that, up above sixty thousand dollars. Was again. that you buying this all this today? <laughs> we were like at sixty four thousand today. At some it's point. been everywhere today, it's right? Insane. Yeah. All right. Next stop for Bitcoin is sixty nine thousand. This is the close on Bloomberg. The private investment firm Vistria Group is expanding its roster of advisors to promote equity for underrepresented startup founders, and they're tapping a pretty big name to do it. Deval Patrick, the former governor of Massachusetts, recently joined the group as a senior advisor. That's in addition to his job as serving as a co-director of the Harvard Kennedy School Center for Public Leadership. Pleased to say the former governor joins us right now here on the big program. And Deval, I do want to start with your your new job, your, your, uh, your job in the investment world, if you will, because... Of course, that's what we're most interested in. And I think everybody really wants to know, why did you pick Vistria? Well, I think Vistria Group is the future of capitalism, right? It's, uh, it's about long-term value, meaning in this case, investing in uh, industries that we know are essential mm -hmm. for the well-being of people, healthcare, knowledge and learning, financial services, uh, credit and access to credit, and uh, affordable and workforce housing, the, the kinds of things that are foundational for people to have real opportunity. And doing that in a way that's both about driving superior financial returns and measurable social benefit is where I think capitalism has to go uh, to, uh, as a system, be sustainable and really to sustain this idea that opportunity for everybody yeah. is central to the American experiment. And that gets to the whole idea of what we've been talking about over the last few years, a more conscious uh, form of capitalism. But as I'm sure you've seen, you've also seen a very conscious pushback to a lot of that, whether it's uh, basically what you just described or some of the ESG measures out there here. Mm -hmm. uh, how does that fold in? Because it, I don't want to say the moment has passed, but you're definitely looking at a situation where investors are looking at that type of space much differently than they did just a couple of years ago? Well, I think, frankly, um, uh, some of that pushback is background noise. It's always been there. It, it comes, I think, from folks who are feeling like they just don't want to have to do much more than figure out how to squeeze every penny out of every dollar. I think that notion of getting a superior return uh, versus uh, uh, a social benefit is, has been a false choice all along. And I'll tell you some of the reasons why, Romain. You know, nowadays, uh, uh, you do, you mess up in a company, you pollute the neighborhood or something like that. Social media is such that everybody knows it will hurt and affect your bottom line. 
why not be more proactive about it? Why, might, why not be more self-conscious and self-aware about the impact of the business uh, you do? You pay people less than it takes to actually live uh, uh, and sustain themselves and their families. Yeah. That word gets around, and it does affect a business's bottom line. So the better and more forward-looking entrepreneurs and business leaders and executives mm -hmm. are thinking about all of their shareholders and their stakeholders mm -hmm. and how to optimize for all of them and making quite a great return as they do. Those are the companies where we at Vistria want to be uh, their capital partners. Yeah, you're saying there's no reason to choose between financial return or social benefit, but to seek financial return as well as social benefit. How do you go about measuring social benefit? Based on the folks that you've spoken with, the startup founders that you're in contact with, what is the most appropriate and effective way of doing that? Well, I think there, uh, first of all, it's really important to be transparent about that with the individual company up front, right? So we're in conversations as we get into deals with founders, with the executive team, about what their own objectives have been, what ours are, how do we align those in terms of compensation, in terms of measurements of, uh, of uh, environmental impact, what they use, how they, what they acquire, whom they use uh, to sustain uh, their own business in terms of uh, subcontractors and what have you, where they are doing business, what is the wage they are paying uh, to their uh, employees and, how, and the benefits, and how can we think about enhancing those in ways so that we reduce the cost of turnover, for example, mm, right, mm -hmm. one of those trades, um, and, and we en enhance the, the uh, uh, sort of in inherent value uh, and respect uh, of a company, particularly one that has a, uh, a consumer-facing uh, uh, nature, so that its overall financial value also grows. So, Deval, you had said that Vistry invests in healthcare, uh, knowledge and learning solutions, financial services, housing. That's a pretty broad swath of the economy. Of those, what is your priority? What are you focused on? What do you think is most urgent? You know, it's a fair question. I love it all because, uh, in fact, in real life, as you know, Scarlett, all of these things intersect in individual families, right? They, uh, they all have to work. Uh, for individual families to have a platform to lift themselves and for their own ambitions uh, to take uh, to take flight. Um, we have uh, at Vistria $11 billion under management right now uh, between those different funds and, uh, uh, and initiatives. We continue to grow. We continue to, uh, my own work will be helping to uh, to fundraise, to yeah. source deals, to, t to, uh, to coach the teams. Um, to help them close uh, deals and so forth. And because so much of what we do embraces public policy, right. um, we, uh, I think there's some from my own background yeah. that I can bring to bear to help there as well. Well, speaking of public policy, Deval, I mean, we're all focused right now on the potential for a government shutdown. We did learn right. earlier today that lawmakers have reached some type of deal. This is a deal that pretty much would just keep things going for maybe about three more weeks rather than actually solve our budget problems here. Uh, do you think we're going to ever get to a point where we see a little bit more continuity in the budget process and a budget process on the timetable that the Constitution mandates? Wow. Uh, what, a, what a profoundly important question. First of all, the, you're right. It sounds like what, they, what we have is a kick-the-can solution. That's better than a crisis, um, but it's not really good enough, not for a mature and serious uh, democracy as America is meant to be. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that uh, one thing that has not happened is that there haven't been political consequences for the obstructionists who keep us from negotiating a, uh, a sustained uh, and long-term budget uh, for, uh, 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 for our government. And, yeah. and I wish there were. Yeah. I think that has to be a part of the political activity and conversation as we go into the next elec election cycle. Do you miss government at all? <laughs> um, there are days when I miss it, but listen, we need good government, right? Yeah. I, I've, I have worked in the private sector, the public sector, not-for-profit and for-profit. Yeah. We need all of these sectors to be pulling in the same direction, and it's back to this idea about opportunity and how do we make that real in every corner of the country for everybody. All right, Duvall, I appreciate you taking the time. And I'll just say on behalf of myself, a kid who grew up on the south side of Chicago, to watch your trajectory from the Robert Taylor Homes to where you are today, always inspiring, uh, no matter what your bent is. Duvall Patrick over now at the Vistria Group, former governor of Massachusetts. Stick with us. We're going to set you up for what to watch tomorrow. This is Bloomberg.
All right, well, the tepid price action we've had over the last few days after that big record high last week, a big part of the reason, because there's a big economic data point out tomorrow, and I think everybody wants to see what it says. Anna Wong joining us right now from uh, Bloomberg Economics. And Anna, we're talking about the PCE numbers. We know that we're probably going to see continued strength in personal incomes, maybe some softness in personal spending, but what everybody really wants to know, what's that inflation reading going to look like? Yes, uh, so we estimate the core PCE to grow at 0.4 percent. That's pr that's pretty robust. And uh, but but uh, it's, uh, what's hotter is the core services, excluding housing, uh, which some people refer to as the super core. That is likely to come to 0.6 percent on a monthly basis. Um, on an annualized 12 month basis, that's growing at a, a uh, 7 percent rate. So. Um, that so it would be a pretty ugly inflation print. That said, I think that um, Fed officials would be wary about overreacting to this very strong print, just because a lot of the uh, a, a lot of the hotness is due to seasonal uh, residual seasonality issues. So, how much do you expect Fed officials to incorporate that into their comments as they've been kind of out and about speaking about the state of the economy to the market? Yeah, we have exactly seen um, several Fed officials downplay the January uh, inflation number today. We saw from Susan Collins' speech, uh, so that she is the Boston Fed president. She said we, we won't overreact to one month of inflation data. Uh, unfortunately, it looks like the February inflation data is also likely going to be hot just because uh, there's also residual seasonality in February's data. So it's not until March or or April when we will truly have a good read of whether the underlying inflation is coming down or yeah. in, indeed disinflation has stalled. Yeah, and that's going to be the big conundrum for all those folks betting on rate cuts or maybe rate hikes, depending on your opinion. Don't Anna, go there yet. <laughs> Anna Wong at Bloomberg Economics here. And in addition to the big PCE data tomorrow, we got some other economic data as well, including jobless claims. Jobless claims are uh, still above 200,000, but you mentioned personal income and personal spending. That's going to really shed a lot of light on the state of the consumer as well. Absolutely. And maybe we get some light shed on what the Fed does next. We're going to have a sit down with Mary Daly, of course, the San Francisco Fed President, David Weston. Uh, I believe David Weston. Oh, yes. I got that right. He's going to be sitting down with her. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And of course, got, looking ahead, <laughs> yeah. we have uh, the president, Joe Biden, and also the uh, former hopeful president, president yeah. and former president, yeah. Donald Trump, both traveling to the U.S.-Mexico border. They're going to be 325 miles apart from each other. Okay, so but... is there the wall separating them or what? How does that work? <laughs> Just distance. Okay, I'm not sure that's going to be market moving, but of course, in an election year, the optics matter. Yes. But so too do corporate fundamentals. We do get some more earnings tomorrow, including from a couple interesting tech companies and one interesting retailer. Yeah, Best Buy will be announcing results, and uh, that will include the holiday shopping season. So it'll be interesting to see what it says about consumer demand for those big electronics. How many times? Did you go into Best Buy during the holiday show? I actually season? went there quite a few oh, times. Yeah, because oh. uh, big screen TVs were really cheap. I looked at a lot of them. I didn't buy any of them. I just looked at them. <laughs> well, that seems to be the conundrum for exactly. Best Buy. Be interesting to see what those earnings say before the bell tomorrow. Team surveillance on coverage of that. And right here on the close, Dell HPE will be all over that. Please join us tomorrow. Always appreciate you watching. And stick around. Balance of Power is coming up with all your politics news. This is Bloomberg.